So let's start with our day today. So first up we have Nikun Jain. He's a digital intelligent evangelist having cross geographical experience and, and is always looking for opportunities to learn and explore new bleeding tech. He's a CTO of uh, New Relic for South Asia and uh, he belongs to the church of Graph and is a, like, a big time monitoring obsession guy. Like, and he's a big time coffee freak and a foodie and a traveler. And today he's gonna speak on building a DevOps culture based monitoring center as easy as one, two, three. So I request you all to please welcome him with a big round of applause. Up to you. Thank you. Yeah. So I've got a bass voice. I'm going to try to speak without getting too excited, right? And that was a really uh, cool introduction. I'm not all that interesting. On a day-to-day -day basis, I fire front. You know, just like you guys, I'm at the forefront firefighting on behalf of my customers and on behalf of my company. So I like to call myself Nick because Nikunj apparently is a tongue twister for Australians and I live in Oz. But anyways, I'm not that important, the content is. Um, for this particular presso, I'm going to take you on a journey whereby I want you to think about anything that you want to achieve in life in terms of how Chuck Norris would do it. How many of you know Chuck Norris? Uh, show of hands. Um, for the other folks, don't Google. I'll tell you who he is. So Chuck Norris is uh, a legendary action celebrity, right? Sort of like Arnold Schwarzenegger and all, all your action heroes. So in Indian terms, in Bollywood terms, he's like the Dharampaji of uh, Hollywood. Now, the idea behind this slide is to uh, you know, walk you through how you can easily set up a monitoring center in world-class fashion. But I think no presentation is complete without a disclaimer, so that my company's lawyers don't get behind my tail. So just to get them out of the way, the slides are my own recommendations as an expert in this field. I don't intend on bashing open source because you'll see open source here and there. I'm a big believer in open source technologies. I, I'm, I'm a member of Linux Foundation. I have the utmost respect for CNCF, and I love what's happening in the open source uh, you know, uh, arena. Get ready for a series of bad jokes. I know it's Sunday morning, you guys may have had a big night, and you found the motivation to come all the way here to listen to this guy who looks like just another guy out on the street. So I have to be able to add some value. So to keep you awake, aside your coffee, I have some bad jokes in there. This is not gospel. Uh, as I pointed out, this is what I have seen over the last decade in terms of how monitoring has shape-shifted. And lastly, I don't mean, mean to preach the choir. A lot of you, you know monitoring, you do it on a daily basis. This is just my dollar two cents in terms of uh, explaining yet another approach. So I initially decided I'm not going to have an agenda, but to have proper guides in places. This is what I have planned. I'm going to share a typical transformation story. And in fact, there are two flavors in there. The first one is uh, a born in the cloud, like the Gojex of the world, like New Relic itself. And then the second one is a lot of those companies uh, that are now trying to transform. And we all look at transformation from our own roles, from our own perspective. So today, I'm going to talk about how do you look at transformation uh, in a new light, that it makes sense based on your own role. And then I'm going to dive into how the challenges are bigger than you thought. And next, I'm going to paint a picture on what is needed for full stack observability and why I think it's a tedious task. But there are a lot of potential solutions out there. 
and I'm going to uh, share with you a proven recipe. I can promise you this much. I've worked with over 200 companies in terms of monitoring in my course of career over the last 10 years. So this has worked for a lot of those companies, so this will work for your company. Now, for those companies that were born in the cloud, and I gave you two examples, some of them, they started back in 2008, and they had a typical Ruby on Rails application. They had a Java monolith in place as well. They had one or two databases, a couple of queuing systems, some load balancing. So literally one or two small pieces uh, you know, floating around which supported their business and their end user journeys. And they, most of the times, had one or two regions in terms of data center. What really changed? You all know this, probably even more so than me, because a lot of you are the doers, the executioners. And I typically walk with you, I partner with you to enhance how you do things. But for, for folks who might be just starting in their career, maybe they don't know how uh, a typical uh, born-in-the-cloud unicorn type of a company looks like, they have tens of front-end applications. They're broken down, they're decomposed. Then they have hundreds of microservices underneath the hood. They have hundreds of databases. We talk about one database per microservice. And then they live in multiple regions. So horizon horizontal scaling rather than vertical scaling. Now, if your leader walks into the room on a fine Monday morning with the coffee and a smirk on the face, we are in trouble, he says or she says. And the next thing they say, we need to fix the mess we have enabled. And I'm talking about a typical scalability issue. So many years ago, uh, when Docker first started happening, you know, the cloud momentum kind of came to the uh, uh, front of all these tech companies. And things like Kubernetes uh, were not that popular. Our chief of engineering, Nick Benders, walked into a room and told the guys, we've hit the fan. And you know what I mean by something has hit the fan. And the next thing he said is, we need to transform. We need to embrace DevOps. And everyone in the room was like, I think what he really means is we are going to adopt a bunch of technologies. We're going to train people. And really, uh, the impression was most of the people assume DevOps is a tool set. But what it really is, in, in my uh, one-liner for DevOps, it's shared pain and responsibility. That means you really leave your egos, your experience behind, and you have a laser focus on your outcomes. And it's all about culture. So what we did is, in a room like this, our entire engineering and product management uh, team gathered. They reconvened. And there was a private consultant at that point in time. He basically recommended that choose your team. Whoever you want to work with, choose them. And people were like, are you serious? I'm the product manager of mobile uh, monitoring, but I really wanted to be a marketing guy. Do you really, are you telling me I can do that? And he was like, yes, with a plain face. And for all the managers and the leaders, the second thing he did was write on a piece of paper whom do you trust the most in this organization? And the second thing he requested was, write in another piece of paper, uh, who do you want to work with and who do you like? That was a trick question. He threw that second piece of paper away. And that was our New Relics DevOps journey. It was our transformation story. And I think this private consultant really knew what he was doing. And he didn't say, let's clean up your CI CD mess. Let's uh, introduce continuous integration. Uh, what he really meant is, if you think of a dumb analogy about transformation, you go to, to the gym, you take incremental steps, and hopefully in a year's time, in six months' time, in a few weeks, however audacious your goal is, 
you achieve your transformation, kind of like Chuck Norris. So that was our story. And what I learned through uh, years of engagement, DevOps is really just culture. So if you're trying to solve scalability problems, look inwards inside your house and clean up uh, the team politics. You know, Harness a blameless culture. But I think, as I told you, I'm not here to preach you. I have another story to share with you, and this time with some cartoons. Some, anyone has seen uh, this particular animation? Anyone in the room? One guy. So you must be a K Kubernetes dude. There you go. <laughs> so this is a courtesy of Days Incorporated. And what I did is I looked at this animation for teaching Kubernetes to children. And then I was like, ah, I could use this for explaining monitoring. So what I did is I stripped the individual characters. So you have Appy, the application. You have Captain DC, the data center. You have Captain QB, the Kubernetes ship. And you have Goldie the Gopher, uh, a really uh, phenomenal programming language and uh, the Golang of the world. So that's another animation for you. This is back in the monolith world. I'm trying to make a change into the production system. And the whole thing jumps. And <laughs> the problem there was there were all these little uh, silos. And we used to cluster the silos, and we used to call them applications. And Appy used to live with Captain Data Center and other Appies during that time. Then Appy felt like, I need more interesting things happening with me. I need more updates. So Appy set on an adventure. Appy uh, uh, met a whale on that journey, obviously your Docker. But again, once Appy onboarded on the Docker service, Appy was feeling lonely. It needed a, a bigger plan, a, a, you know, more Appies, just like the data center days. So then comes along Captain QB. And Captain QB uh, looked at Appy and, and said, do you want to come on board? I have pods for you. So Appy went on board and met other uh, Appies whilst on board. And that's when Appy realized there were non Appies on board as well. And one fine morning, Appy got evicted. If you get that joke, there is a pun intended here. Appy got evicted for something Appy didn't do. So I'm really taking a dig at uh, how you monitor Kubernetes systems uh, in today's time, right? So there are a few different methodologies for for those of you who understand orchestration and Kubernetes services, they either uh, test uh, the, the timeouts on a particular port, they rely on CPU or the resource exhaustion type of metrics, and the third technique is uh, just push and pray. Hopefully nothing will break. Now what happened is uh, after that incident of eviction, the misunderstanding got cleared and they lived happily thereafter. It's just like yet another Bollywood flick. It never happens in real life. Wrong. It was the same challenges, just distributed now. So it was all over the place. And in fact, Appy got blamed on a daily basis. <laughs> so today, I shared two stories with you. One is a company that joined the cloud momentum harness the power of dockerization, uh, packaging of applications, and then using all this beautiful technology right from the get-go. And the second story was for those companies that felt the pressure from the innovative companies and decided to go on a transformation journey. So those were my first two nuggets. Now, Abhinav gave a really uh, edified version of my resume. Uh, I'm just a glorified engineer, right? I built my own monitoring tool back in the days from the ground up. I'm talking uh, late 2000s, so 2008, 2009, I started coding. And then uh, I realized there were professional tools out there. 
The second thing I started doing is I started speaking fluently in full stack monitoring, aside five other languages, which is a combination of programming languages and real human languages. And I'm secretly a purist, even though New Relic pays me the money to keep the food on the table, I truly look at something uh, that's going to uh, you know, add value to your ecosystem. And I always am the first person to agree to disagree. On a typical days, I work with Kiwis, Malaysians, Koreans, Aussies, Americans, Spaniards, and Indians. So I have a multicultural team. It's crazy. We, we, we have over 50 uh, nationalities within our team. That's the APAC team. Now, let's understand the current methodology. You have this big feedback loop, and you have Sumo logics, open source, new relic for that subsection where you start thinking monitoring. But what I've seen is, in order to fix anomalies and confusion, we add more confusion. So there, uh, that's how I came up with this, uh, you know, my own concept of Monitoring evolution is exactly like human evolution. We were stupid, then we became intelligent, then we went back to our roots and became stupid all over again. Right? And how can you take that stupidity away? And what caused the stupidity? It's firstly data overload. And secondly, in order to take that confusion away, you need to have a recipe, which I'm about to share with you. Um, in terms of this uh, enterprise strategy, right, there is noise, inundation, choice paralysis. It's like walking into your supermarket, and then I don't know how the supermarkets are here anymore. I moved out when I was 15. But when I go to a supermarket on my street with my wife, we look at the aisle full of cereal bars, and a lot of these cereals, it's like, 20 different aisles just giving you options on cereals. So our world is really like that from a technology standpoint. You face choice paralysis. And I can't do much about that because I don't want to be an expert in something I'm not. But I can take the performance pitfall away for you. The third thing is don't buy into the philosophy of thinking DevOps as a software solution. It's not. It's just a culture. So focus on the culture aspect. And you own the processes, not the other way around. The processes don't own you. So sometimes don't be scared of jumping the gun uh, rather than following the process. And fourth, because now API got decomposed, and then there are other APIs, and there are so many different pods, the number of combinations and permutations are astronomical. What that means is there is communication anomaly, there is asynchronicity, and there are tracing complexities. So I'm going to focus on the performance aspect of it. And here is another little uh, day in the life of an end user. So I, I know uh, Netflix uh, DevOps uh, leader pretty well, because I, I really look up to him in terms of inspiration. The first thing he told me is, this is what we are trying to do. You know, take this problem away. You have your popcorn, your your entire family guarded on the couch. The next thing that happens is you get this screen, and you feel like flipping your TV. But at least the companies can be smart about it. So in this scenario, Netflix says, go outside and play. Get healthy, right? Get off your back, essentially. I have started seeing uh, there are some really cool concepts on how to manage errors gracefully. And then there are a few methodologies out there that uh, bleeding edge companies are applying. But the reaction to that experience is you onboard something in a hustle. Once you onboard it, this is what it gives you. And I remember I saw this post from a CTO of a monitoring company a couple of years ago. And it was a graph like this. And the CTO posted, you can clearly see where the problem is. I'm like, are you serious right now? And again, I'm not trying to bash any monitoring company. That's why I'm not going to do a name drop. But I was like, it has to be simpler than this, right? This is just adding more complexity to your environment. 
So in order to uh, move towards the recipe, you have to understand each other's challenges. So the first challenge number one for developers. Developers, back in the days, they were like, I just know how to code, mate. Right? That's an Aussie for you. But in today's time, they need to know configuration, versioning, packaging, deploying, running, monitoring. They need to think monitoring in their design thinking. And they need to know things like how to code and deploy in public cloud, Terraform in terms of configuration, treating infrastructure as a code. They need to understand containerization, orchestration, deploy tools. Um, it's, it's, it's a nightmare. <laughs> If you want to be a developer in today's time, uh, you better start early, right? The second scenario, now think from the business uh, perspective. Get in their shoes for a moment, wear their hat. They are thinking, how many more dollars do I need to throw here? And they are like, no time to train. Please just innovate and solve this. And lastly, a lot of companies, they do squadization, which I refer to as their version of modernization, which means let's uh, call the old operations team members as DevOps consultants, and others simply re-architect the teams, and they're like, yep, we're good. Now, from the end user's perspective, just like the bang Bangalore traffic can give you a heart attack, slow pages responses cause a heart attack as well. There is a study by uh, Harvard University. We all know Harvard. We look up to those institutes. They came up with a paper in which they mentioned about the rise in hypertension and blood pressure when the web pages are slow. So there is a larger cost here. We're really trying to save lives. The last part is on the SRE uh, side of the house. They want to save we want to save SRE folks from a nail biter, just like a cricket match, right? Uh, and SRE folks are like DevOps. What is that? Um, I'll update my resume tonight. I'm applying for new jobs. When their uh, managers kind of walk up to them and like, you have to learn DevOps. Next thing they go, automation. Yeah, that's my thing, right? It's going to make my life easier. Uh, but all those changes are wrappered by classic operations practices, which are the practices we uh, invented in the 90s. So that has to change. Before I go into the change side of things, oh, by the way, if you are trying to be like Chuck Norris, you have to know that Chuck Norris creates containers without Docker. <laughs> right? Um, in order to uh, really manage and monitor effectively, you have to understand the beast. So this is what an application looks like in today's time. And the reasons why companies uh, adopt a lot of tool sets, they are worried about fear of missing out. And there is one guy in the company who, who is super excited and uh, that guy goes, Docker, FTW. Now, don't Google FTW. Um, <laughs> I, this is a professional environment. I want to stay professional. Um, so your typical application looks like uh, the top piece in the puzzle. Think of this like a wedding cake. So the first layer is your web user service. The second layer is your mobile uh, native services and your mobile web experience, backed up by microservices, functions, SOA, API layer, service bus, all those uh, new and old concepts. And then supported on this ever-changing infrastructure landscape, Docker, cloud hosts, VMs, elastic managed services, non-application services, the non-appies of the world, and all the changes propagating within this environment. Now, a lot of uh, monitoring solutions simply allow you to monitor everything, but they don't manage changes effectively. So I'll talk about changes because they are a crucial piece to setting up a world-class monitoring center. So the first approach is, now I showed you the problem, 
And I had a nice segue into why do you care about the problem. But this is uh, what is really needed to solve uh, the monitoring requirements. And the reason why I called it choice paralysis, convolution, confusion, is because this in itself looks pretty complex. So are you going to build your own? Uh, there is a quote by Twitter's ex-CTO, Alex Payne. He said that, I'm not in the infrastructure business. I'm not here to build monitoring systems. I'm here to create a social media platform for the future. What he meant by that is, I'm going to use ready-to-use tools because there are challenges with building your own. And, and some of the challenges are the process itself, in terms of setting up a monitoring center, is hopeful uh, full-stack observability, which means you don't leave any blind spots. Second, you need to propagate signals and get them into a visual of your choice. And those visualizations will be your monitoring outputs. So things like alerts, dashboards, distributed traces, uh, the, the implementation of the four golden signals as preached by Google SRE practices, which is beautiful, I think. So there are a lot of challenges with building your own. And one of the challenges, look at the pitfalls. Infrastructure management, it might work in the beginning, but then it will start having scalability issues. Second, you have to allocate dedicated teams for monitoring. Third, deviating from the outcomes. You will end up deviating from the outcomes because you will go into management of the queues, management of Kafka, but you really care about the outputs. And then shallow monitoring syndrome, which means you walk into a restaurant, you don't know what to order, so you look at the menu and you order something that sounds right. So I call it the a la carte metrics collection. Now, this is where I will take you into a trailblazing roller coaster type of step one, two, three to really hit the problem at its heart. So first part is understanding the beast. If you are tasked with monitoring a monolith, that's easy. You don't have to go through a complex methodology like this. But module level data uh, is going to give you a lot of help, helpful information for debugging. But it's not going to give you uh, simple answers like application dependencies, inter-service API processing, and network latency. So you download an agent, you deploy the agent right, for monitoring a monolith. How this has changed? Because now there is this uh, shape-shifting matrix-like uh, service layer that you need to monitor. And monitoring can't be an afterthought. Because if, if I use French for a moment, I'm not really going to use French. I don't know French. Uh, if you think about monitoring or your, your services as a ball of problems, distributed services is distributing those problems around. So if you're going to react to monitoring setup, it's not going to cut. And you need to uh, work from the get-go. So this is where you need a crime mystery solver and a CCTV type of service. Why I call it a crime mystery solver? Uh, application problems and user experience problems are really just like um, a crime scene. You know, uh, there are broken glass in one corner of the room. There's blood stains in another corner. There were footprints. But somebody from uh, house service walked into the room and removed all those evidences. So monitoring after uh, the problem has happened is kind of like the, the evidences are gone, and you're trying to do the forensics collection. You need a CCTV. So this is a cross-service view where you start from service one. And this is a historical view into the transaction, the Netflix moment, right? The oh crap moment. Uh, I was expecting on watching uh, you know, a series that's popular right now. I finally hit the weekend, but uh, the service is unavailable. So this is 
for those teams that want to quickly find out where in that haystack the needles are. And there is machine intelligence in place, so it can automatically color code a certain layer if it's 200, 300 individual spans in the stack trace, it's going to point out which span is anomalous. But before you even uh, go there, you require a plan. So let me share the plan with you. Just like in your life, you have three M's, your marriage, your midget, your kids, right? And your mortgage. There are three M's in monitoring. So the first one is mean time to failure. The second one is mean time to identification. And the third one is mean time to repair. So you really need a robust system. Don't just think monitoring here. Start in the code phase itself. And then build your monitoring agents in your build uh, deploy system. I'm going to show you some code examples. It's all about making the right thing the easy thing. There, there are always these right things you should be doing, like uh, you, know, you need to get, get this shuttle on moon. But is it necessarily easy? So I'm going to show you how it, it sounded a bit complex, the, the problem we are trying to solve. Now I'm going to show you how you can make it easy. So first thing, enable monitoring on the go, which means in your code itself, the monitoring is baked in. So you have some beautiful build systems. You might be using uh, one or more of these. You want to uh, solve the murder mystery by finding out why the JavaScript library was throwing errors. So there is a concept of uploading source maps. But if you were to uh, upload source maps manually, each time a JavaScript error, that creates the checkout experience. Or uh, for the Gojek example, if it's uh, that particular experience where the, the, your, your ride gets booked up and the JavaScript exceptions are happening, that's a critical portion of the user journey. So instead of manually uploading these source maps to immediately point out which line of code is the problem, you take a simple script approach. And you could use any domain-specific language. Uh, the idea here is to eliminate toil. So what you do is you use a little uh, script like this, but what if it's slightly more complex? It's about enabling agent through a script. So that's where you firstly start uh, using a service like Gradle. You add your configurations, but this is busy. There's a lot of moving parts. Any wrong configuration and your app will break. So a better approach is to make this a plugin in its own right. And a third thing you can do is you can even compress the plugin further, not have too many moving parts. Follow the, uh, the microservices concept. Treat your agent like a microservice and add it in like a single plugin where all the dependencies are annotated. And again, the Chuck Norris, if, if you were Chuck Norris, when you write functions, you don't need arguments. But for the human uh, in us and people like us, yeah, that's, that's the approach I recommend. So the key takeaway is make it easy to monitor everything, right? So monitoring on the go. Now, a second scenario is, and before I go there, if you are trying to monitor EC2 engines, then bake the agent within your AMI configuration. If you're trying to monitor uh, Elastic Beanstalk, then there are possible integrations that go, go hook themselves straight into uh, the EBS Elastic Beanstalk service. So now the second part is, I said, there are all these changes. Somebody hopped on the system, made a little change on the configuration, changed the IP, changed the entity name, and the app broke. Or somebody deployed a new set of code which broke the application. So how do you manage changes? So that's the second need. But even before you manage changes, you need to have a common deploy system. If every team within an organization where you are enabling a key end user service, if you build your own deploy systems, 
which you could refer to as a snowflake. Um, the, the way those changes will propagate and slip into production services is going to be painful in terms of managing and tracking those changes. So firstly, fix your deploy system, speak a common language, and then start deploying markers and version tags. So what that looks like, there are all these beautiful APIs available to mark a deployment and see the before and after of a deployment in terms of what's happening to my core signals, the CPU, memory, application response time, API response time, database response time, all of those things. So I'm going to cruise through this and show you another example. Chuck Norris does not deploy. He develops on the production services. right? But we don't have the luxury like him. So we take the API approach, mark the deployments. And if, if you are marking deployments, don't forget to tag your deployment name. So you can see a graph like this. Pre-deployment, there were 60 router counts. Post-deployment, uh, incrementally, it came back to 60 deployment counts. Now, I, I, I can see this screen is flashing in front of me, which, is, which means I'm running out of time. So I'll have to cruise through a few things and take you straight to the nuggets. So tag everything, because tagging is powerful. And then the last phase is activating your monitoring center, which means you even treat dashboard and alerts as code, just like we started treating infrastructure as a code. So there are some neuroscience concepts there. We always under alert and we over dashboard. So there are some principles of tracking your four golden signals. And these are a bare minimum uh, uh, number of things you need to do in terms of having a full alert alerting strategy. Have I run out, out of time, Abhinav? Am I good to go? Another five minutes? Cool. So I took this chapter straight out of Google SRE book because they have nailed it. And their uh, services, let's just talk about Google search engine. It has hundreds of thousands of moving pieces. If you don't track these things, you wouldn't know why Google search engine is slow. So they do things like infrastructure saturation KPIs. But you don't set alert for each and every infrastructure piece. You do outlier detection within your alert. So when you choose an alerting service, make sure it has outlier detection. Second is dynamic baseline. Gone are the days. You configure three seconds, seven seconds, because Monday slow is Friday's fast, because there are more people on the service. So you have to have a dynamic uh, thresholding system. And then you have failure state detection and error rate detection. That's, so these are cross-service examples. So error rate on front end will be JavaScript errors, AJAX errors, HTTP response code errors. Error trace on the back end will be uh, your code exceptions, your handled, unhandled, Golang, Java, .NET exceptions. And then error rates for a service that should be available will be failure state. So you know, think SLIs, SLOs, SLAs. So I's are your metrics, your indicators. O's are the objectives, which will detect uh, a, a bad condition. And SLAs, if, if you really get that matured, then you're thinking, if I am using GA within my service, and GA does not respond uh, with whatever screen within a certain time period, then I can call them and hold them accountable. So those are the SLA type of tracking. So monitoring alerts as a code, we have similar APIs. You go into, I'll, I'll show you code examples rather than showing you uh, just screens. So IBM built a CLI tool based on our APIs to do auto alerting and auto dashboarding. So what they did is they called all our APIs into their CLI, which is a new relic command line uh, you know, client. And then they, they create auto alerts and auto dashboards. We also take the same approach within New Relic because we believe in drinking our own champagne. So we monitor New Relic with New Relic. And we take a similar approach. So what does that look like in action? Uh, so we'll ignore Chuck Norris for a bit. Dashboard templates 
instead of having hard-coded uh, service names, entity names, you variableize them. So it just works for all your clusters, all your entities. And same way, for event statuses, this is a second dashboard example. If you want to filter based on a particular event, like use the same dashboard for failed state and successful state, then you can do something like this. Uh, we do have Terraform scripts. We have CloudFormation scripts. So you can search for our agents on there. But I'm not here to preach New Relic. Use whatever you want to use, but make sure it has these things in there. Now, the last part is to treat alerting as a code as well. So there are examples. This is a Ruby code, which is a domain-specific language for treating alerts like code. And all we have done here is we are defining the condition, we're defining the policy, and the notification channel. So condition is your detector, average response time greater than its baseline equivalent this morning. And then you can do things like use uh, the service degradation uh, criticality within your condition. So when you wake up from your uh, good night sleep and you have to look at this alert and it says F3, you can go back to sleep. What we're really trying to do as a monitoring company through this recipe is we're allowing companies to sleep better. So I'm going to cruise through this, and that's my key takeaway. In conclusion, this is what you need. I, unfortunately, I don't really have the time to go through all of this all over again. But it's the same screen which I showed you for build your own. And there are several b benefits, like plug and play monitoring, self-serve, multi-dimensional mat uh, metrics, curated views, so ready to use rather than ready to build. Um, and these are your key takeaways for this talk. Understand the beast before you start solutioning. Enable monitoring. Think of it like code. Uh, use a common deploy system. Tag changes. And then lastly, uh, have a solid dashboarding and alerting strategy. So again, you know, it's really that simple. Chuck Norris doesn't really need debuggers. He just stares down at the code until the code confesses, right? So thanks, thanks for your time. Uh, appreciate your spending 40 minutes out of your life with me. Thanks a lot. Hello. Hello. Thank you so much, Nikunj, uh, for sharing with us like the problems that you face when you intend to have observab observability over your service and what are the do's and don'ts. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Thank you.